Well, you know, it was a lot of community. Uh, and I, looking back over the years, I listened to my mom and dad talk about the community like in the 50s because we weren't as, in, and even when I was growing up, we weren't as mobile as we are nowadays. So, you know, my family maybe went to Grand Junction twice a year. <laughs> Peonia was it. <laughs> and my folks talk about everybody came to town in the 50s on Saturday night. So there was probably more of a sense of community just because of that, because of have to. And uh, of course, you know, the kids I grew up with uh, <clears throat> here in Peonia, they were either coal miners kids or ranchers kids, predominantly coal miners kids is who I grew up with. But we weren't mobile. We didn't have communication. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, you know, a lot of those things. So and because of a, almost a have to, I think we probably had more of a sense of community just because of that. Because there wasn't, you didn't pay attention to the outside world. I mean, everything was here. And, uh, you know, in some ways we've lost that. You know, some good, some bad about it. But, uh, but it was probably a bigger, you know, just sense of community as a whole rather than now what I see is you've got <clears throat> you know, almost like little tribes, then then they still they still are a community, but there's several different communities within one community. And I think at that time it was probably more, you know, all for one, one for all. But just because it had to be. But there was a lot of freedom with that. I mean, you know, we did a lot of honorary stuff when we were growing up that you wouldn't get away with in phase these days. <laughs>
then they homestead it around that and we have purchased some places around that also but currently we own about a thousand and fifty acres and a lot of it is just rangeland that's not all irrigated tillable ground but but uh, that's that's our ranch you know and uh, she passed away right around the turn of the century and uh, she would I think she probably had diabetes. Uh, she was going blind. And uh, so she passed away when the younger of those children were, you know, nine, 10 years old. My grandfather would have been about 20, I think. So, but uh, she was, I think, a very hard worker. And, and of course, homesteading is a lot tougher route than most people have. A, any realization. I mean, they pretty much tried to grow their own food and uh, relied on hunting, and, and uh, then they got into livestock. And but predominantly, I think they lived off of game and what they could grow in gardens. When they first moved here in 1889, they went back to Montrose on provision trips. So you know that's. 50 miles in a buckboard just to get provisions here. So the railroad didn't come to Peonia until I think 1902. So those first 10, 15 years, this was really remote. Yeah, and it, and it varied. It varied somewhat from family to family. You know, there's a lot of them. They became a working partner in reality. And there wasn't anything that the men did that the women couldn't do too. And when it came to working the cattle or whatever, but for the most part, you know, they they cooked and cleaned and took care of the house, and and uh, you know there was always food on the table and and uh, took care of the kids. Uh, my mother worked out a little bit. During the fruit season, she would come down to the packing house and and help pack fruit, and she did that for her Christmas money, so she could turn around and spend it on you know the family. But uh, they they were a tough bunch, no question. And uh, you know they you talk to a lot of the old ranch wives and. They not only cooked for just the family, but they always had to have a hot meal for the hired hands during hay season. And so, and a lot of that was over a wood stove during the summertime. Of course, most of the places had almost like two kitchens. They would have a, a kitchen inside and then they'd have a cook stove out on a, like a porch, screened in porch. That's what they used in the summertime. But, uh, you know, they, it was always a tradition and up until just the last few years, really. But, uh, you know, ranchers always got together and helped each other out, too, during branding, branding or whatever, haying or whatever. And but they always that was part of going and helping the neighbor was you got a hot meal at lunch. <laughs> it was usually better than what you could go to town and buy. <laughs> but they they had a, a, you know, it was a hard life for women, I think. I don't, I don't deny that a bit. And I, it took uh, a lot of uh, perseverance and I guess a vision of where they wanted out of their family to stay with it. Because it, it was not easy. And then, you know, like, you know, my father, when he was growing up, uh, and we aren't as isolated as a lot of places, but most of big ranches ended up having a, a house in town so the kids could go to school during the wintertime. Because, you know, when you were only horseback, 
uh, even we're about four miles out of town, but that's a pretty good trip in the morning when it's uh, ten below. <laughs> My father, uh, now when he was in high school, he stayed out there with my grandfather on the ranch during the wintertime and rode his horse to school, to high school. But before that, when his sisters were older than he was, his mother and he and his sisters lived here in town so they could get their education. And that, if you look back at a lot of the, a lot of these communities on the western slope, and like I say, some of them more isolated than we are, but that was pretty common. I, I know people my age that still did that, like up at Craig. They, uh, they lived in town during the wintertime so the kids could go to school. We've been, uh, and I'm, I'm the fourth generation, and my son's the fifth, so. But, uh, you know, you do what you have to do. Uh, my grandfather was you know, running the ranch during the 20s and 30s. And, uh, you know, things were, were looking pretty good up until World War I. I think, uh, I think he, he uh, was kind of a mover and a shaker, was kind of a leader among cattlemen. And, uh, but I think he felt, he felt a lot of discrimination during World War I. And uh, he spoke with a German accent and was embarrassed by that. He told my mother that. And, uh, and he kind of was ready to give up. But he didn't really know what else to do, so he kept going. And there was pretty lean times, I think, in the 20s and 30s when my father was growing up. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, the 30s were uh, extreme drought, 1934 was uh, still the year that they talk about. And we've just now rivaled it here in the last couple of years as far as uh, extreme drought in this part of the United States. So they didn't have much of anything. And, uh, but they learned how, they just kept going. They didn't really know what else to do. Uh, <clears throat> they they did dabble, the family dabbled a little bit in fruit, I think, in the early teens. Uh, but between freezes and that was really not where my grandfather's heart was. His, his heart was with livestock. So he predominantly became a cattle rancher. And, uh, and then that was passed on to my dad and then on to me and my siblings when we came along. But you know, they, my dad worked in the coal mine uh, in the 70s to try and help pay off debts. I mean, you know, the place has been refinanced more than once. <laughs> and uh, and it, that's just the way it is. And uh, to, to do some of the projects that he did, they were big in developing water. Uh, my, they had the previous generation, my grandfather and his brothers had tried to build a reservoir in Reynolds Creek and it had breached in a big storm event. And my dad was able to get that done in 1952. So, and, and that reservoir, actually uh, the town of Peonia used that, our water in that reservoir during their water crisis of 2018. So we, uh, kind of had a little civic duty there that we helped out. And then uh, they, they continued to look at that as an emergency storage if something were to happen. So uh, the, they've sold some water to the town of Peonia. Both my grandfather and my dad sold some uh, first decree water to the town of Peonia for their domestic use. I mean, uh, we've we put our land, my dad put a lot of the land in a conservation easement with the, then it was the Division of Wildlife, it's now CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, <coughs> for deer habitat, winter game range. And uh, so we've done a lot of things trying to make ends meet. And uh, my, 
brother-in-law and I increased the size of the operation, mainly through lease ground, and try and run more cattle because it, you, you know, you, you, it's like any business. There's a kind of a line there that economic scale, and uh, so we actually run almost double of what we ran, what my father ran, but uh, and <clears throat> but it's it's on a lot of it is lease ground because the ground's so expensive it's pretty hard to pay for it with livestock. <laughs> so, so we've gone gone the route. I've uh, I did eight years as a county commissioner here in Delta County. Just got done with that, so that took me off of the ranch payroll. And uh, so we've you know we managed to make things work, and that's my motto is kind of like the Marine Corps motto of you know you improvise, you adapt, you overcome. So that's that's kind of how I was raised, and that's how we continue to to uh, sustain ourselves here. So, well, water is the lifeblood. I mean, there's no question about it. This is a this is a semi-arid desert in reality, and it's it's nothing like the Midwest where you know they get 35 inches of moisture in a year, and the average moisture for this area in Peonia is about 12. And most of that comes during the winter with snow. So the runoff of that snow in the early spring is predominantly where most of the water comes from. The springs and, and of course that also comes from the aquifers that are recharged by the snow. So, you know, the water has always been precious to take care of and the, the amount of work, when you look back in the 1890s, 80s, 90s, and the amount of work that they did to try and get water to a piece of ground is just incredible. I mean, it's backbreaking work. They didn't, have, they didn't have the big machines we have now. They did it by hand, horse-drawn slips and, and uh, <clears throat> built some of these reservoirs with horse-drawn scrapers and slips and packing the, you know, what would be one bucket for a dirt for a excavator. You know, they were packing it several hundred feet, trying to make a dam, uh, digging a lot of the ditch by hand. I mean, the, the physical labor that they did was just incredible. And uh, they just, you know, but they had a vision in, in mind that they had to have that water to grow anything, which they did. Other than, <clears throat> you know, a lot of this country was predominantly just sagebrush and grass, which is part of why the livestock industry flourished in the 1890s. That's predominantly what was here. They started growing some fruit down here first, down here on the river, where the water was close and it wasn't ex as expensive to get to. But then when they started up on some of the mesas, I mean, uh, our uh, Rober Ranch, <clears throat> my great-grandfather got a decree out of uh, Minnesota Creek for a half a foot of, of first decree water filed on in 1883. Well, that took over six miles of open ditch that his sons and he and his sons dug just to get it to the ranch. So, <laughs> and you know, <clears throat> they had to, they figured out contours and, uh, you know, knew a little bit about surveying to figure out where they needed to go with the ditch to, so it would flow, but keeping it on grade where it didn't wash, because if you run too fast down the hill, it would take the hillside with it. And they had flumes they originally they were wooden flumes that uh, went across draws and then they switched over to tin open flumes where and built trestles and you know suspended them up in the air to want run across a deep draw and get them down but and that was just one of many i mean all these ditches around here that's the way they were built 
and uh, you know, there's like 40, I think there's over 40 ditches just here in the Peonia area. So if you think about the manpower and labor that it took, <clears throat> and uh, you know, that's been passed down, is how important that is, because without it, you're not going to grow much. And uh, it just, this is not the climate for, uh, that you just put seed in the ground and it grows. <laughs> it, I could say, it, you know, this area, <clears throat> it was, uh, some of it was, it was settled different than a lot of other areas because of the Ute Treaty, when they removed the Utes, they uh, allowed people to just buy property rather than just homestead it. So you had a, a, quite a few smaller places show up and they were, I mean, I refer to them kind of as starvation places because they didn't really have enough land or enough water to do what they were trying to do. And several of those up there is part of what my family bought up. They were 40 acres out in the middle of nowhere and uh, went ahead and bought those because we kind of surrounded them or whatever. But, uh, you know, it was pretty tough. People had, a, it was opportunity and they sold that, the government sold that ground for a dollar an acre. So, uh, you know, they were trying to settle it, but on the other hand, you know, to homestead a piece was 160 acres, but you had to prove up on it and make, you know, show that you were trying to make it better. And uh, so there was a combination of both that went on here. And uh, because of that, the, the upper end of this valley got chopped up into smaller parcels than you see in a lot of other places. And, and then, like I say, it was, as time went on especially, they found it tougher and tougher to try and make a family living on 40 acres or less. So, and most of them, a lot of them during the, you know, the 20s, 30s, even 40s and 50s, the mines only worked, the coal mines only worked in the wintertime because they predominantly were producing coal for heat. So a lot of people worked in the coal mine in the wintertime and farmed, ranched in the summertime. And uh, then as the uh, coal mines changed, especially with UMWA and, and in the 60s when they were, were producing a lot of coal for steel manufacturing, then it became more of a year-round job. But you still had a lot of people that did both. You know, this this up until just the last few years, really, a lot of people worked in the coal mine and still had a, a small farm on the side. And they worked in the coal mine for the money. <laughs> hmm. That's that's pretty that's pretty difficult to try and point to one yeah. particular instance. I mean, there's there's so many things. I mean, it uh, a lot of the, my experiences of uh, growing up and probably especially riding riding range and up in the mountains and uh, just feeling at home doing that. And I mean that I uh, that was probably what I loved to do more than anything was uh, you know maybe there was a little bit of the Renaissance mountain man in me, but of being up in the wilderness and uh, just with your animals and uh, and then seeing the wild animals and interacting with both. <clears throat> I mean, that, that probably as much of it as anything for me. I mean, I, a, lot of the, a lot of the humdrum part of it 
you learn to tolerate for the special times. <laughs> but, uh, you know, <clears throat> as far as scenery, you can't beat this area for scenery. I mean, and, and as far as experiences of seeing things, wildlife and uh, close encounters with bears and everything else, I mean, that all kind of fit into it. And uh, I guess, you know, maybe there's a little romanticism in me that uh, thinks could have been part of that crowd from 100 years ago, you know, but and then trying to make things better as, as you go along with that. Well, I think part of it was um, I've been involved in, um, you know, kind of, especially with uh, the cattlemen's associations and whatnot, and trying to preserve, I guess, our way of life. <coughs> and uh, I thought I had something to offer for the county of trying to keep this place somewhat special. So uh, I, that's probably why I put myself out there. But, and, you know, I don't, <clears throat> I don't live for those type of legacies or anything. Um, I didn't, you know, I served eight years. I uh, made a, learned a lot. And like with anything, I probably learned more than I gave. But uh, uh, I like to think that they were successful eight years. They, we uh, went through quite a transformation in those eight years because while I was serving is when we went from three coal mines to one and question about whether that will even survive. So, uh, you know, it's, we, uh, on the other hand, I like to think that maybe growing up and, and being involved in the ranch it helped temper some of the, because we were used to tightening our belt and that's kind of how we ran the county for several years. There was, you know, we, you, didn't, you didn't do something that you couldn't afford and you didn't, <clears throat> you just learned how to get by when, and improvise and adapt. And that's uh, that's uh, kind of how we we can manage to get through it. But uh, you know, thinking back, probably one of my favorite movies when I was growing up came out in the early '70s. So I was like middle school. Was Jeremiah Johnson? <laughs> you know, everybody dreamed of being like Jeremiah Johnson, <laughs> the mountain man and hunting <laughs> so that, my friends and I we spent a lot of time hunting and and uh, just being out in the you know out in the woods but fishing no there's no question you know those and you know you, <clears throat> you tend to grow apart but then there's always there's always a part that you always remember too, and and uh, you know, it, and then playing sports together and everything in in these small schools, it it's almost like uh, you know I almost relate it to experiences you hear about with uh, veterans that you know have gone to war together or whatever. It's it, it's almost like a band of brothers and. Just those experiences. So. Don't want to relate too much to that because I know, you know, those guys that were in combat have a lot, <laughs> a lot different, more of a bonding than than we do. But on the other hand, it's it's similar, I think. And I think that's a lot of what, you know, people talk about the coal mines and those guys who worked up there. And I worked in the coal mine for. A couple of summers when I was going to college, and you know what what gets the work is not great work. The money's good. It's you're underground. I mean, it's you know it's not great, but it's uh, the other people is where you get through that. And 
like I say, the camaraderie that just goes with that. I think, you know, my dad went to work in the coal mine in the mid-70s when he was, you know, 50-some years old. And I think at that point in his life, that was something because he had been so, you know, somewhat always on his own, he enjoyed that camaraderie of having other people. And I think, you know, I think he, he worked in mine for like five years, but I think he really enjoyed that time just for that reason. Yeah.